At the start of the last federal election campaign, the NDP were coming off their first stint as the official opposition and polling at levels that made it possible they might form government. That, it turns out, was not meant to be. The New Democrats finished back in their customary position as the third party. They've since replaced the leader, it's now Ontario's own Jagmeet Singh, but have struggled so far to get him or the party moving up in the polls. Plus, much has changed in the past three and a half years. What does it all mean for the NDP's prospects? With us to consider that, in the nation's capital, Cameron Holmstrom, former Parliament Hill staffer for the NDP caucus, now a consultant with the Blue Sky Strategy Group and editor-in-chief of the political blog, magpiebrulee.ca. And here in our studio, Hello. Sid Ryan, past president of the Ontario Federation of Labour. His new memoir is titled, A Grander Vision, My Life in the Labour Movement. Jennifer Hollett is here, former head of news at Twitter Canada and an NDP candidate in the 2015 federal election. Paul Taylor, executive director of the Toronto-based nonprofit organization Foodshare. And we welcome back Libby Davies, former deputy leader of the federal NDP, former member of parliament for Vancouver East, and author of her own memoir called Outside In, A Political Memoir. Good to have everybody on the program here in our Toronto studio. Cameron, Thank nice you. to have you there in the nation's capital with us as well. I want to start this discussion off by just reading something from McLean's magazine that will set the table for the discussion to come. Sheldon, the graphic if you would. Since Jagmeet Singh won the NDP leadership in 2017, the NDP has remained a distant third, polling nowhere near the numbers of either Jack Layton in 2011 or Tom Mulcair in all his reign as leader of the opposition. Before Singh's Burnaby South by-election victory in February, the NDP had lost ground in 14 of 15 by-elections held during the current 42nd Parliament. Even in recent weeks, with the election of Singh to the House of Commons and the SNC-Lavalin saga pulling the government Liberals down, the NDP still has not gained significant ground in the polls. It has been a year and a half since Jagmeet Singh won the NDP leadership, and I want to find out from all of you why those numbers are where they are. Jennifer, start us off. Yeah, well, I will say, as a new Democrat, mm -hmm. uh, we're a, a party that is the underdog. We represent the underdog. So I don't get too faced by poll numbers. I actually wish the reporting of polls can be banned. Because I think as a country, <laughs> we're so obsessed with polling. And unfortunately, we don't have electoral reform, despite the fact that the Liberals promised 2015 was going to be the last first-past-the-poll election. So I just have to put that out there, because we keep getting trapped in this political system that benefits the Liberals or the Conservatives in every election, and it plays out in the polls. Uh, as for the uh, election as, of Jagmeet Singh as leader, uh, I was someone who voted for him. I was there when it was announced. It was a very exciting moment. I think Jagmeet uh, brings uh, an energy and a movement and a vision to the party. You're still as excited about his leadership possibilities. I am. We're not in the campaign yet, uh, mm -hmm. but I do think that he inherited uh, a bunch of challenges that are not his own. Plus, he didn't have a seat, and he's navigating 2019 and everything that's, that's unfolding. So there's uh, a lot uh, that he's had to try to get done in the last year and, and a half. And some of it, uh, that's on him as a leader, but a lot of it he's, he's taking on since we didn't have uh, an active leader. We had an interim leader during this long leadership race. Right. Paul Taylor, I want to get your take. I don't know, we should say as well, you're seeking a, uh, an NDP nomination in the city of Toronto. So fire away. Why, why are they where they are? Well, I think we're, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I think um, <clears throat> we're not unaccustomed to polling third. So I think I'm not uh, focused on the polls that much. I think we still have quite a bit of time before the next election. I think we also have to remember that Justin Trudeau and the Liberals were polling in third before the last election. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, getting engaged for the first time in, in this big way, uh, I'm inspired about advocating for my community. I'm inspired by advocating for a bold vision for Canada. So that's what I think we have to keep focused on. Sid Ryan. Um, I didn't support uh, Jagmeet going into this uh, leadership uh, campaign. I was with Nikki Ashton. Um, but uh, since uh, Jagmeet got elected, uh, I do say to some of my friends on the left, um, let's cut him some slack here. Like he, he hasn't yet managed to get into the House. This was going back a couple of months ago. Um, so clearly that impacts on, on our polling numbers to some degree. You really need your leader in there challenging Trudeau face to face. Um, I think once the electorate gets to see Jagmeet Singh, I think um, things are going to turn around quite a bit. Um, he has had some blips along the way, like the Aaron Weir uh, issue with, in, in Saskatchewan. I don't think he handled that very well. Um, I don't think he handled the... the uh, we should just say parenthetically here, he, he evicted from caucus Aaron Weir 
for yeah. accusations which, as, as it turned out, were not accurate. Precisely. Yeah. And, and, and Aaron Weir is a very popular uh, member of Parliament out in Saskatchewan as well, as well as within the caucus. So I don't think he handled it very well. And I think that... Some know, women felt he did handle it well. I think well, that's up for debate with members. Uh, maybe so, but the public perception of it was that he didn't handle it very well. Um, it left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Certainly um, the caucus out in, in uh, Saskatchewan and former uh, members of parliament in, in, in Saskatchewan and also former members of the NDP caucus uh, at the provincial level. Um, so I think he got a little bit of bad media out of that. And consequently, that has hurt these numbers a bit. But I do honestly believe um, that when he gets going, uh, when the public get to see him, I think he's the right leader at the right time because the party has got to reach out beyond um, the base that looks like me, you know, bald-headed, white-haired guys. Um, we, really, we really need to be going out to people of colour. We need to be going out to, um, you know, new immigrants, new Canadians, uh, refugees, broaden the base, much like the Labour movement has to do. Yeah. And I think Jagmeet is in the right position at the right time to do that. Cameron Holmstrom, your view. Well, for me, obviously during the start leadership race, I was backing and I was backing another candidate. But when my candidate dropped out, I went to Jugmeet because of the potential of that he had. And I've seen, I saw him in action. I saw him in events. I saw a lot of natural retail polit political ability that made me think, okay, there's a lot of potential if if groomed right. If when the experience comes, that could go a long way. And having spent but having worked a year in his caucus in that time, I have to admit, it. I, I came away with concerns. I, obvi I believe he's gotten better, he's improved, but there have been slip-ups. Uh, in my opinion, the Aaron Rear situation was not one of them, and I think you can talk to every single NDP staffer on Parliament Hill, including uh, Unifor 232, the union that represents the NDP member staffers there, that that was, held the right, uh, was, was handled the right way because of what happened. But the fact of the matter is, is that I think the, the polling aside, the NDP is, oh, we've always struggled with this. I still remember being in the middle of the 2011 campaign with us sitting at 12% nationally, and look where we ended up at the end of that. So yes, things can shift. But I look more at what's underlying in those polls and some of the things that are shaking loose. And I am concerned, personally, that we're seeing kind of uh, break up a bit of the core of what's made up the NDP, that balance between rural, natural resource workers, unionized workers, and, and more urban, further left so, social activists. I think we're seeing a bit of a breaking up of that right now in the current environment, and that's not a very easy thing for any leader to, to deal, deal, deal through, let alone a brand new leader like Jagmeet. Okay, Libby Davies, I've purposely left you to the end because you're the only one around this uh, literal and metaphorical table who's actually been elected. You're not running for election in the upcoming election, but if you were, how comfortable would you be going into that with Jagmeet Singh as your leader? Oh, totally. I mean, I, I think he's a great guy. And I think he's going to do a lot better than people in the media or maybe others are predicting that he's going to do. Um, I like, you know, I'm okay with the NDP being the underdog. We're, we're kind of used to that. We're, we're scrappers. We fight. Uh, we fight in our nomination races. We fight to be the candidate. We get out there. That's what makes us so good, you know. Um, historically and today. So I think I'm really happy that uh, Jagmeet Singh's in the House. I think that was very important. So I'm glad that happened. Um, he gets the feel of the place. It is different from Queen's Park. I think he's going to do very well in the election. I, I really have a gut feeling about that because I think he's very engaging. Um, he's very likable. And that's an important part, part of politics is how you engage with people, firing people up, particularly young people. And I think he has that potential and capacity and he's shown us that he can do that. Um, you know, the last election was very difficult. Uh, then we sort of saw, you know, the love in with, with Trudeau. I think that's completely gone. So we have an incredible opportunity in this election um, to show Canadians that there is a very bold vision from the NDP, that we have the leader who, and, and we have some great candidates who are seeking nomination or already the candidates. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel good. I'll be out there helping as well. Uh, you know, we, we speak plainly on this program, so let's do that right now. Jennifer, he's the first racialized leader of a major political party in Canadian history. That will be a problem in some parts of this country. How concerned are you about that? It matters, and it's also an opportunity. So many young people across the country can look to Jagmeet and see that they can be a part of politics. I remember as a young person growing up, I got into politics actually as a much music DJ when I was assigned to cover a federal election. And uh, we extended an invite, if you can believe it, half an hour on much music to all the party leaders. And only two party leaders said yes. 
So no surprise, Jack Layton, the NDP, and a shout out to Jim Harris uh, in, in the Greens, came on. Uh, we didn't hear from the Conservatives, we didn't hear from the Liberals. But I remember as a young person feeling that I wasn't represented. And this is as a young white woman, and there are white women in politics and there are white people in politics. So already there's a disconnect in terms of the issues, in terms of representation, in that plain language, how we talk about things. It is a game changer to see not just a racialized man, but a turbaned, brown, sick man out in the community, bringing the passion, the vision, and the leadership that is Jagmeet Singh. I think that's gonna bring a lot of people into the party, and we saw that with this leadership race. We see new people mm -hmm. as members of the party, and we see new candidates coming in, uh, because you can't just talk about diversity, you can't just talk about growing the base. <clears throat> You have to be it. Well, you're one of those new candidates who's now seeking a nomination. If he weren't the leader of the party, would you be as interested in seeking that nomination? You know, I might not be. You know, I remember growing up, my mother always sat us down in front of the television uh, whenever the CBC ad issue panel was happening, anything like that. And for the longest time, I looked, watched, and I thought, huh, politics is something that only white men do. You know, that's, that's what I, my takeaway was. A few years later, I thought, oh, okay, white women also do politics as well. <laughs> never thought about myself. You know, growing up as a low-income kid in downtown Toronto, never saw myself as part of these conversations. So I think it's a really, as Jennifer says, it's a really significant moment in time where lots of folks across the country are able to look at a party leader and see someone that not only reflects um, perhaps the tone of their skin, but also some of their lived experiences uh, with the darker skin. So I think that's really exciting. I'm also really excited when I have conversations with other folks that are inspired to run across the country. These are people who, for the first time, many of them are saying, you know, this is a party that does reflect our values, that we can get involved in, that we can push and really be a meaningful part of. And I think a lot of that is down to uh, really inspiring leadership. Cameron, having said that, you know, money talks in politics, and at the moment, the money's not coming in. Uh, why not? I think there are a number of issues on that front. I think some of it's uh, some of it's a, a hangover from what happened towards the end of the, the previous leadership of the party, that that did leave obviously a, a dearth of money in the bank. But also, frankly, we lost a lot of good people. A lot of good people went elsewhere. When we when we lost official opposition status, we lost a lot of good people who decided to go do who either lost their job or had to go do other things. And I don't think we've ever quite come back from that whole experience. Um, to me, that was one of the reasons why I supported Jagmeet was his ability to organize. And when I saw him signing up so many people, I know when I was helping run uh, Pat Stoker's campaign at the very start, the number we had in our head to be able to sign up to new members to be able to win was, was about 50,000. And Jagmeet got just under 50,000 votes. That's what, and that's what his team did, and to their credit. And to me, I was always, I was of the belief, okay, if you can organize like that here, that can translate over to the party side. And unfortunately, it just hasn't happened yet. And, and uh, for, for various reasons, some things have gotten in the way, uh, um, issues have gotten in the way, but it still doesn't change the fact where we are where we are. And it does leave us behind the eight ball right now going into the campaign, and that does leave me worried. I know I've had people who are seeking nominations in other places reach out to me within the last week asking, is something going on because I'm not getting calls back about not about my nomination, about my about my package, about when my nomination meeting is going to be. And we're seeing things roll out, but now we're so far behind the ball that it makes it we're having to catch up that much more. So I, I'm my, my hope is, is that things turn around pretty quick. I know there's some great people there working out of the federal office here in Ottawa who are doing their part. But the, the fact is that we're, we're not in our strongest position. We're definitely not in the position we were in in 2011 or 2015. Libby, I want you, if you would, to give us some insight into some of the British Columbia politics here. Because, of course, Mr. Mm -hmm. Singh is of Ontario, was an Ontario MPP, but he represents a riding in B.C. right now, and he intends to uh, seek re-election in that B.C. riding. He initially was in favour of the pipeline proposal that would have gone through British Columbia. But then we saw a dramatic... Uh, reversal of position on that, and he's now trying to sort of outgreen the, the Greens and the Liberals on the environmental side of things, going for very, very dramatic green policies. What's going on here? Well, I think the uh, the by-election was was a bit of a wake-up call. Um, I think the whole the issue... The one the Greens won, you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the whole issue of climate change is critical, not just in B.C., but across the country. And I, I feel really heartened that uh, the leader is taking up this issue with great force, because I, I, I truly believe that the NDP is the only party that can bring forward um, an agenda, a strong, bold agenda on climate change that is also connected with um, a transition to good jobs. Um, we have 
the partnership with the labor movement. We understand the labor movement. We understand the importance of, of labor rights. The labor movement might want those pipeline jobs. Well, but, there, but we're talking about transition, right? Mm -hmm. How's that going to happen? Who's going to do that? I have no faith in the liberal government to do that. Um, they have a corporate agenda. Um, certainly the conservatives are just beholden to the oil and gas, uh, you know, corporations. And so to me, this is an amazing opportunity for both Jagmeet and the NDP and all of the candidates um, to, to, um, to get on board, to talk about the future and to say we can actually realize a new kind of economy, we can meet our international obligations on climate change um, and, we can, and we can bring people with that. I, I, I just believe that so strongly and that's got to be a central issue in this campaign. Well, the NDP is the party to do it. It's got some people... <clears throat> let's say mischievously pondering some possibilities, namely of a green NDP merger. Uh, and so I'll give you the first kick at this. Look at the monitors here in the studio, if you would. We're going to bring up some, this is out of McLean's <coughs> magazine. And I don't know if you can do this, but, but for argument's sake, let's say they could. Merge, an NDP green dream team is the way they put it. And if you were able to actually combine the NDP and the green votes in some of the latest polling, you'd get the Conservatives sitting in a band of between 30 and 38 percent, you get the Liberals between 27 and 35 percent, and you get the Green Democrats, again, putting the Greens and the NDP together, <clears throat> somewhere between 23 percent roughly and 30 percent, which puts them much more competitive than either one of them is individually at the moment. And then if we flip over the next chart, someone did a seat projection of that as well, and it shows uh, the Conservatives in first place with Let's just take the middle number, almost 150 seats, the Liberals with almost 120 seats, and then the Green Democrats with almost 60 seats, which is a heck of a lot better than they are right now, individually. Sid, does any of this make sense to you? Uh, no. Why Be not? Because if the Greens do not have a good position on, on basically on their fiscal conservatives, um, we jokingly call them conservatives on bicycles, um, because I don't think uh, that their policies, when you dig deep down into beyond the environment, um, when you dig into their fiscal policies, um, they are pretty much in tune with where the conservatives are at uh, in terms of the, their um, economic uh, policies. So I think th this time around, we need to be far more bolder than we've ever been in the past. Well, merging um, these two parties would be a pretty bold I don't, move. I don't think so. Like, no? you take a look at where, 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 where is the Greens on, on um, uh, free university, for example? Where are they at on pharmacare program? Where are they at on the, these big ticket items um, <clears throat> that we're calling for? I think we can, and I'm glad that, that Jugmeet has actually um, rethought his position on the, on the pipeline in BC. Um, but we have a real golden opportunity to work with the labor movement and say to union leaders, you've got to step up to the plate and be honest with the members that work in the extractive industries, oil and gas. It is, it's, a, it's a dying industry. It's not the future of, of uh, where jobs will be in this country. It's, they're definitely going to be uh, in wind power and solar power and the new energies. Um, and you've got to be able to be talking to your membership saying, look, why aren't you using your influence with the liberal government? Because some of them like Unifor like to, you know, play games with the liberals. So we'll go and say to those folks, instead of putting four or five billion dollars a year into the extractive industries, oil and gas, why don't you put it into a transitional program to transition workers into the new energies and, and the new fields? I think if the NDP come out with a bold platform along those lines, um, take a look at what Jeremy Corbyn is doing, take a look at what Bernie Sanders is doing. For God's sakes, if you can talk about socialism down in the United States and still be rising in the polls and not getting pilloried, well, why can't we have the Socialist Party here in Canada uh, openly not be afraid to use the S word and put forward an agenda that's really progressive in front of the electorate this time around. We've got nothing to lose. I don't think this business of, you know, clever, cleverly playing around with numbers to say let's have a merger with the Green Party is going to save the NDP. Well, for argument's sake, let me go to Cameron on this one. Cameron, uh, do you think that the Greens and the New Democrats have similar enough values that a potential merger could create something interesting in a new party? No, I don't. And, and, I, and I, for different reasons, what Sid just laid out. The, the, the fact of the matter is, is that there are tra historical differences between the parties. But again, I come back to this historical composition of what the NDP has always been. <laughs> I know in Libby's um, interview, she mentioned the roots of the party. And there's always been that balance between the, the fact that the NDP, we've been able to represent downtown, urban, 
uh, left of center people, but also at the same time, uh, people who work and live in forestry communities and mining, in the oil and gas sector too. All these people we've been able to represent. And right now what we're seeing with, um, as you put it, trying to outgreen the Greens, especially with what just happened in BC the other day, is that we've now basically got, we're now on the record opposing the single biggest private sector investment in the history of the country. Like that, that to me, it, it, it's mind, mind blowing, especially when so much of labor, most indigenous communities are behind it. And I say this as an indigenous person, that at the end of the day, trying to find something that matches up and that can help that transition, because LNG can help the transition, it's not the end, but it's part of the path. It's something that allows us allows us to get to our goals. And the fact is, is that if we go, if if we're going to go to that merger and say, okay, we're going to join up with the Greens, you're going to lose a lot of people in that center left people, especially a lot of labor voters who are going to say, look, at the end of the day, I believe in these things, but I also have to feed my family. I have a mortgage to pay. I don't want to see my town die. You know, I grew up in northwestern Ontario, and I saw what happened when the forestry industry went down. And it, it forced a lot of people in a terrible situation, taking huge losses on their homes, being forced to work two time zones away and commute back and forth, or up and leave and take the loss. And you know, I don't want to see people in the oil and gas sector go through the same thing. And that's why I agree we need a, a just transition, but it needs to be just that. A transition is not two steps A to B. It's A to B to C to D. There's a little bit more to it than that. And that means putting everything on the table. We can't exclude options at this point. And that's what I see happening with the LNG, the, the LNG uh, uh, pipeline in Northwest BC right now. To me, that is an option that can help get a lot of a lot of Asian nations off of coal. Is that going to be the permanent solution? No. Okay, we got some people back here who want in on this as well. Go ahead, Mr. Taylor. I would unequivocally reject the idea of a merger, and I think it's something that's not often talked about. But when you look at I don't hear the Green Party talking um, about a racial justice lens or a racial justice approach, you know, particularly around the environment. Something that we know, when we look at climate change, we know that folks of color are disproportionately affected by the impacts of climate change. I think I'm interested in running with the NDP because I think the NDP gets the, the, the importance of prioritizing racial justice, <clears throat> has that lens to environmental policy. I don't see that in the Greens. So it's, and, and, and I also think historically the NDP has, has been able to attract the most diverse candidates. And I think it's because we're putting forward policies that uh, resonate with the lived experience of diverse folks. Jennifer? So in the last election as a candidate in downtown Toronto and University of Rosedale, I knocked on thousands and thousands and thousands <laughs> of doors, uh, not just during the campaign, but in the pre-campaign, which is, you know, uh, <laughs> what you're in the middle of, of doing right now, Paul. Uh, and... Uh, Voters were obsessed with the question of, would you form a coalition with the Liberals? They were obsessed with this question. And our answer in the last election was, yes, you need to ask that to a Liberal candidate, right? And they didn't have an answer, right? So there's always been this like larger question from voters who are uh, progressive or center or even just like up for voting for different parties. That's the, the beauty of our uh, our country and our elections, right? Is that people who in the past have voted conservative might vote NDP, people who have voted, like, like sometimes I can't even understand how it happens, but it happens and it's great. <laughs> um, so I think absolutely there's a conversation to be had. Can we work together? And we've seen what's possible in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of creating a new party, no, the NDP is here in this election. And I agree with you. It needs to present a bold platform and be unapologetically NDP. I right. think that's the mistake we've made in the past. I think is Paul, that we're shy about being social Democrats. I think Paul, though, put his finger on a really good point. Um, in the past, the 905 area has been um, the nirvana, nirvana for, for the Tories and for the Liberals. Um, with Jagmeet getting elected out in the, uh, well, he was elected in the Bramley, Brampton area at mm -hmm. one time, he will, he will bring a lot of um, support, a lot of cachet in that community. But even where I'm living out in the Oshawa, Whitby area, um, the demographics are rapidly changing. Like, I've got a young uh, granddaughter, a young racialized granddaughter, and I walk her to school a lot. And her whole classroom is basically, I, I would say it's 60% uh, young people of color. You can see the demographics are changing. So the 905 area may not be the, um, uh, the nirvana that it has been in the past for the Liberals and for the Tories. And with somebody like Jug Meat um, be, uh, being able to appeal, um, out in the Oshawa Whitby area, which is always won. Well, the Oshawa is won by the Tories. The, the um, uh, Whitby area. Can I follow up on that with you? Because sure. you know, back in the day, uh, you will acknowledge that the union leaders used to come out and beat the drum hard for whoever the NDP leader was, right. and then they'd vote for Bill Davis, and that's why a lot of seats, a lot of seats that you would think would vote New Democrat, ended up voting Tory, and that happened during Mike Harris's years as well. 
Uh, and it's happened now again, now that Doug Ford is premier of the province. Are you offside from the labor movement uh, at the moment, Sid, with this anti-pipeline business and, and w with I, some of these other measures? I've been off, and it's in my book, I've been off, offside with him for quite some time. Um, I, I, I liken it back to the days um, when the labor movement were supporting the asbestos industry, even though we were killing people in the, with the asbestos industry. Um, <clears throat> same thing with the tobacco industry. We were out there banging the drums. I, I always oppose these industries. And likewise, now I'm saying to folks, you know what, it's time you stepped up to the plate and be honest with your members and actually told them that these jobs are, are a dying job. You know, you can see it already. There are more folks working in the renewable energy field uh, in Canada than what's working in the extractive industries. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a cold hard reality. And the more we go towards electric cars and, and uh, um, uh, renewable energy such as uh, wind power, the more we go in that direction, um, the less viable those jobs are going to be in the oil fields. And we really need to start putting money into transition programs to be able to say to these workers, and by the way, the jobs in, in renewable energy, they're really good paying jobs. I've got family living in Denmark and they've got a thriving industry when it comes to building windmills. You know, 200 tons of steel in those towers alone, a thousand moving parts in the turbine that sits on the top of them. These are all good paying jobs. You can export them to China. They should be here. Like, you know, the mechanics, they're, they're electricians, they're engineers. They're fantastic jobs. Jeffrey. In regards to those working class union votes, and you're absolutely right, the NDP is often associated with labor for good and bad, uh, even if the votes go otherwise. After uh, Jack Layton's success uh, in um, uh, at the federal level, uh, there was, yeah, in 2011, there was uh, a poll done uh, looking at voters who had voted for Rob Ford in Toronto, but had also voted for Jack Layton federally. And uh, what those voters said is that they thought Rob Ford was going to stand up for the little guy, like them, and that Jack Layton was going to stand up for the little guy. Mm -hmm. So I think often we get obsessed with the party or the leadership and what that leader stands for and that personal connection really matters to voters and we've seen that historically. Oh, I think we saw the same thing in BC with the Reform Party mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. back into the 80s, right? Where uh, people saw it as standing up for the little guy. But, but to come to your question, Steve, um, I mean, I think so much in politics is sort of from the top down. Um, and I think it's very important to allow debate and you know the grassroots to speak. I think it's going it would be a very tall order to think that there'd be some kind of merger in the few months that are left between now and election day. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm mindful of the fact that, uh, for example, Jack Layton was the guy who worked very hard to be open to the idea of agreements and coalitions. We've seen that in BC. Uh, the NDP is the NDP. We are different from the Green Party politically. There are different positions on different issues. We've heard some of that uh, today just during our discussion. Um, but I think the whole notion of what happens afterwards in terms of um, the outcome of an election, uh, I think that's all yet to come. Uh, I, I still think that the NDP is in a very um, good place in terms of um, the political spectrum overall. And if we can get out there and to have a really bold and strong agenda, particularly on climate change, the economy, social justice, um, I think we can win over a lot of voters. Let me pick up on that. And I, to do so, I want to read an excerpt from your book. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this graphic up. And here we go. Whether it's the anti-apartheid movement, indigenous rights, Occupy, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ plus rights, workers' rights, farm workers' rights, or sex workers' rights, these movements began in a community where people faced daily oppression and degradation. These movements all needed allies too, people who hadn't necessarily directly experienced oppression, discrimination, and violence, but were willing to put themselves on the line. That's the history of social change. This raises for me an issue. For a lot of people, that is going to sound like identity politics. That is going to sound like politics that focuses on the grievances of a smallish chunk of society and ignores, <clears throat> if I can put it in Ford Nation terms, you know, the vast broad swath of the little guy who feels unrepresented in that panoply of, of um, identities. And I wonder if, Cameron, let me go to you first on this. In our remaining moments here, do you think that if the NDP produce, uh, follows that kind of identity political path, they're setting themselves up for defeat again. I don't think it's a matter of setting yourself up. I think it's more of a matter of how do you actually connect the how do you connect these experiences and issues to people's day-to-day -day lives. And I, I say this as an indigenous person 
who helped write our Indigenous platforms in the party the last couple campaigns. It's one of these things where, like, look, at the end of the day, if you're saying all the, great thing, all the right things, that's great. But if you're not grasping the actual meaning behind it and how it connects to my day-to-day -day life, and I bring it back to the resource development piece. We have uh, Romeo Saganach's uh, UN Declaration Bill up in the Senate right now. And a lot of people get hung up on this idea of free prior informed consent and what this means. But I've seen people in the environmental movement, I've seen people in the, in the Green Party do it, I've seen people in even NDP do it, treat this, that indigenous rights as if it's some kind of bulwark against development or against this or that. But really at the end of the day, what it's about is the right to have consent, the right to choose, to say yes or no. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna talk about our issues and you're gonna raise our issues, but then put it in a frame that then kind of goes counter to their true meaning, it's not going to have the, it's not going to have the, the, the effect that you're looking for. And I give okay. Jack Layton full for, marks for that because he got it. Forgive he me, took the uh, time Cameron, out. I'm going to jump in because we're running out of time out, here and I want to make sure it. everybody gets a chance at this. So, uh, Paul, you tell me, uh, is the NDP risking going down the wrong path by focusing on, as some people call it, identity politics at the expense of Mr. and Mrs. Everyday Canada, if you want to put it that way? I think, um, further to what Libby said, we really have to focus on a bold vision. We have to connect uh, people's everyday lives and their experiences. And there's so many people. You know that 30% of folks that historically don't show up to vote? I think those folks are the folks that we really need to be engaging as well if we're going to um, seize the opportunity that the Liberals have presented, I think. It's connecting with the single parents. It's connecting with young folks and uh, connecting with tenants and making sure that their issues are reflected in our platform. Libby? Well, you know, so much in politics, why is it that we always see things as it's got to be this or it's that? It's this box or that box? I don't see them as mutually exclusive. It's so important. In, in the political world today that people see themselves reflected, that we engage with people, particularly people who have been shut out of the political process and not represented. But that doesn't mean that we don't also speak to broad issues that affect those people as well as all people, right? So I don't see them as opposing things. I see a political path where it's about engagement. When people are cynical, they get turned off, and they shut down. When we engage, that's when transformative change takes place, and that's give, what we need to see happen in this campaign. Forgive me. Let me give 30 to Sid and 30 to Jennifer to finish it off. Okay, well, I see it as, as uh, forming a what I call a common front. Um, in the labour movement, we'd be regarded as social unionism, where you're actually connecting with partners in the community. Um, so it may be Black Lives Matter, but it could very well be uh, a tenants association. It could be retiree organizations. It could be women's organizations. Um, so it's broadening the base and, and also dealing with uh, the identity politics as well. But it isn't exclusively just dealing with identity politics. I do think it's, it has to be much broader. Um, the broader we can build it, I mean, Barack Obama did it basically. Mm -hmm. He built a broad coalition, the Big Ten, call it what you will. Um, and that's what helped me win. Make no mistake, the everyday Canadian is black. The everyday Canadian is a young person. Mm -hmm. The everyday Canadian is environmentalist. Yeah. The everyday Canadian is a woman saying, I'm really scared, but me too. Mm -hmm. Right? So if we want to truly present a platform that is offering a fair and green economy, that includes everyone. So mm -hmm. I reject the idea of identity politics. We need a politics that includes everyone. And I do feel the NDP is the best party to do that. I want to thank everybody for joining us on TVO tonight. You don't mind if I sell a couple of books here, do you? <laughs> okay, that's one of them. That's Libby Davies' latest. It is Outside In, a political memoir. And we thank you for coming here from British thank Columbia you. to join us. And Sid Ryan's going to join us next week on the program because his autobiography is just out, A Grander Vision, My Life in the Labour Movement, which he tells me he spent a decade writing. So I'm going to read it this weekend, and it better be good, Sid. <laughs> here we go. Great to have everybody. Cameron, thanks a lot for being there for us in the nation's capital as well. Appreciate having you all on TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.